If you're anything like me, I find it nearly impossible to make a connection with anything if I do not understand what the value of that thing is. Connection and value go together. This is the definition that I'm speaking about. Value is one's judgment of what is important in life. And this is very important to understand because as individuals, we judge what is valuable to us. And everyone has a value, even if that value is their own opinion of nothing. They at minimum value that. And what is valuable to us drives our actions. It causes us to react a certain way when we value something. And most of us, I would venture to say that the concept of life is valuable. And I say concept for a reason, because we clearly see that various aspects of what life is, is not valuable. But the very concept of life itself is indeed valuable. But the problem is, is that life should not and cannot be looked upon as just a concept. That's the issue. But that's what it is, without having a defining purpose of life. And again, merely valuing the concept of life will never prove to value the ultimate purpose of life. And the ultimate purpose of life, from my perspective, must be objective, never changes. And it includes the entirety of mankind throughout the existence of mankind. That's where the true value and purpose would come from. And sadly, what does man do? Man does not have the ability to generate that objective perspective. They can't, nor the true purpose for life. Man can only attempt to produce what it looks like to them. Then it changes over time as man changes his thoughts and sees fit. Now, the reason why I had to spend some time on this, meaning discussing the value system especially as it pertains to life and the ultimate purpose is because one of the aspects of the ultimate purpose of life from the beginning was life eternal. Here is the ultimate purpose, eternal life. And if this ultimate purpose is not valued, neither is salvation. Now, this is not to say that man wants to live forever absent salvation, because man does. Man continues to search for ways to extend his life. Think about some of the things that man is trying to do. We have people who choose to freeze themselves upon their death in the very hopes that the science would catch up one day as they are somehow systematically thawed out and brought back to life by science. Oh, it's valued, and man wants to live. But their savior is in the wrong direction. They rely on things that will never have them live eternal lives. And then we have people from all walks of life who have been impacted by disease, accidents, you name it, that has somehow prevented them from having a normal life. And many of them, if not all, would do anything to just have a normal body to do many of the things that you and I are privileged to do. This is real. And as a Christian, I could see why that desire would be there to live a certain way. Because the ultimate purpose for us humans was not to face this decaying, discomfort and dying world. We yearn for something better, and there's a reason for that. Why do you think we continue to search for it? We're just looking in the wrong place. This does not have to be our final stage of existence either. We don't have to be living just to die. When I speak to people who believe in evolution, not to go back down that rabbit hole, but you think about it, brought into existence only to not exist. We all have the opportunity to die in order to live though. And this is the why when dealing with salvation, so to speak. Because salvation promises us eternal life, despite what is going on, has went on, or will happen in the future. On this earth or anywhere else, salvation is a promise. But again, this reality has to be valued. But salvation is just a word. I would like to say, all of you, like I know, that salvation is not just a word. In fact, salvation is the word. When we look at the word salvation in the Hebrew, we see the word Yeshua. And we know that the word Yeshua means Jesus. And we also know based on the scriptures that Jesus the Christ is the word captured in John. And again, the word is salvation. And salvation is the why for eternal life. And I want you to know that I deliberately focus on eternal life because of God's word. His word is life and life eternal. In the book of John chapter 6 and verse 63, the word of God reads, this is Jesus speaking by the way, it is the spirit 
who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. This is our Messiah. And we should know how much the true and living God values life because he was willing to allow his only begotten son to die in order for our souls to be redeemed to him. And that is every single soul that chooses to be saved because it is a choice. And I find it interesting that in the New Testament, the word save first appears in the book of Matthew, chapter one, and verse 21, as the word of God reads, and she, speaking of Mary, will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In this verse, I can see at least two major points that should catch our attention. The first one is that we are told the name of the one who would save. It's given to us, a very popular name in that day as well. We know his name is indeed Jesus. We're also told this, what his people are saved from, and that is their sins. It always comes back to this three letter word, sin. This is the problem. It comes back to this word for a good reason. Sin is the root of every problem. We don't like to admit it. We want to think that it's people, but it's sin. We want to think that it's politics, but it's sin. And you can go on and on and on. The problem is sin. This is the reason why we all need a savior in the first place. So in essence, people can still value life and even the life of others. But again, if we do not recognize the ultimate purpose of life, what's the point of salvation? And if we do not recognize sin, then what is the point of a savior? And at the end of the day, this is the real issue that all of us have. And as much as I would love to stay on the life aspect of this topic, death is a reality for all those who choose not to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this death that the Bible speaks about will be a conscious as well as a physical episode. And it will also be eternal. And we should all think about that. Now here's where the offensive aspects of God's word comes in. Oh, it's offensive, right? The thought of eternal punishment because of sin, something that you and I didn't create. How dare God? Really? I believe sometimes we all think that way. Many Christians have a problem with discussing sin. In fact, let a pastor title his teaching, Sin, a couple of weeks in advance and see who comes. But the truth of the matter is, is that death is because of sin and Jesus is the only arrester of death. And then we get into the challenging statement from those who do not believe. And that statement goes like this. Prove to me that I need Jesus to save my soul. How often do you hear this in conversations? Sometimes it's done with an arrogant tone as well. And we have to use discernment whether to answer or not. And I don't want to seem angry or arrogant in any way, but there comes a time where it's not for the person asking the question. It's for someone else who needs to hear it. So if it was this person and myself, maybe I would abstain and move on. But because of the company that needs to hear it, I give an answer. And when I hear that arrogant tone, my answer kind of goes like this in so many words. I say, you know, it's the very fact that you would ask me to prove my Jesus to you is proof enough that by the power of his Holy Spirit, he's tugging on your heart to even ask me or demand me to prove it. That's proof. Furthermore, there is something that we all can agree upon. The properties of reality, matter, space, time, and gravity. We all agree on that. But time is something I wanna focus on because we can never grab back time that we just lost. As we know it today, yesterday is yesterday. So with that said, why would you or anyone else waste that which we can never get back on a favor? I hardly see anyone in the world walking around when someone's on the corner, like someone who's a little bit loopy, talking about leprechauns, go up to him and say, prove a leprechaun to me. You know it doesn't exist. But when it comes to Jesus, yeah, you're gonna ask, you know why? There's a reason for that. But isn't it true? Sometimes we have to answer that way for the others to hear it. And again, it takes discernment to do that, but it has to be done. We as man ask some ridiculous questions in our ignorance when it comes to God. I'm baffled because if we cannot see how evil we are, if we don't know how evil man is, then in my opinion, there is little room for hope. And again, there is no need 
for me to prove that anyone needs Jesus to save their souls. In fact, it's probably better that you prove that you do not need Jesus to save your soul. Speaking of the soul, I want to quickly look at our makeup as humans based on my understanding from the scriptures. And this is not going to be exhaustive. We don't have the time, but I do pray that it would add some insight on why salvation itself is something that we all should eagerly seek to obtain those who do not have it. So, while man continues to dismiss the fact that we are comprised of spirit, soul, and body, it does not remove the fact that this is indeed our makeup. This is our makeup. And the way that the spirit operates and the soul and body are unique. They're connected by a godly complexity that's above my pay grade. But God has indeed provided us with more than enough information regarding our makeup so that we can see his power as well as his character. This discussion regarding the spirit, soul, and body has been taught by many people in many different ways, using many different analogies. And for the body, I believe that is self-evident. It's our physical makeup. And I think we all understand that. It's ultimately controlled, though, by the soul of man. I think that gets lost. But it's within the spirit and soul where this major complexity really begins. And it becomes even all the more complex, barely able to comprehend it in most cases. But at the root of it all, we often have these two organs within the body that are often related as housing our spirit and soul. Not specifically, I'm just saying it's used as an analogy, if you will, to house our spirit and soul. And we see that throughout the scriptures. And they are the mind or the brain and the heart. And they are connected. And you'll see that throughout the scriptures. And again, this is very complex. And I need to keep it simple. And that's what I intend to do. So the spirit of man is the life source given by God. And it searches out man and impacts the mind of man. And man has been given this life source. So man has abilities with this life given. And with those abilities, there's choices. And just like one writer would say, the only way to accurately perceive spiritual truth is through the Bible. This is why man struggles from birth. This is needed. Truth is needed. The spirit that has been given to man by God has been ruined by sin. That's the problem. But even so, God has left his mark within each of us to seek him out. But our nature rails against it. It always rails against the truth. We are automatically born into this sin, an evil state that we live in. It's inherited, every human. In the book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse five, the word of God reads, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is all of us, each and every one of us. This is our evil spirit, and it must be changed into a godly spirit. And that only comes by way of salvation. The spirit of man consists of our intellect, reasoning, beliefs, and most importantly, the mind itself, and God's breath, that life source that we all have. And when we die, every spirit returns to the creator himself. Now, I would ask that you bear with me as I read from the book of Ecclesiastes and regarding this, these seven verses build up to this point of the Spirit of God. It's captured in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. So the Word of God reads, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of the grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, when they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way, when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. And here it is in verse seven. Then 
the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And when this spirit departs, death ensues. And if our minds are never renewed, then we will never have our souls positively impacted, converted, transformed. And everyone must have their spirit renewed. But what follows at some point is the eternal death of the eternal soul. And that is a fact. Based on my understanding of the scriptures, our souls contain our personalities, our consciousness, emotions, and that freedom. And our souls are indeed eternal. When we die, the soul lives on. There's no soul sleep. The soul continues. And the Bible is clear about what happens to the souls of man when we die. We are either in the presence of the true and living God, or we are in the abode of the dead. That's the only option. Our souls are consciously aware of what's happening when these events take place. And with salvation, we are guaranteed to be in the presence of the true and living God. That's his gift that none of us deserve. And as we discuss the spirit that was given to us, that life source by God provides us with the ability to produce data. And this is represented by the ones and zeros on the screen, the binary code that you see. And during the course of our lives, this data is stored temporarily in our minds, but permanently in our souls, or until all things are made new for those who are in Christ Jesus. And our souls are represented by the inner workings of the hard drive, the microchip, if you will. It is internal to the body, but no matter what happens to the body, the data remains. It's very important that we realize this because we are responsible for that data. And then we have our bodies represented by the outer casing of the hard drive. And that encloses both the data that is produced as well as the components that the data is stored on. So this is the way I see it as it pertains to the spirit and the soul. The information or data within our spirit has long been corrupted with the virus of sin. And that virus, sin virus, has been stored within our microchip, the soul. And unless this virus is removed, the data will always be corrupted, rendering the software and the hardware useless. When it's a useless carcass, it gets discarded. And there's no need for any one of us to get discarded. This is why salvation is so important, because it's real. When I spoke about us being responsible for the data, that goes for all of us, those who are saved and not. We will all be judged, and many Christians take issue with that, but everyone will give an account for their lives, and everyone will do so in an everlasting body. In the book of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, the Word of God reads, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And this is not speaking about soul sleep. This is about the body, where the soul will be reunited with it. The difference is, those who are saved will have a redeemed body and a renewed spirit, made perfect with a renewed soul. But those in the abode of the dead, with those corrupted souls, will have a body indeed that will feel the eternal punishment that will be given by God. All because one chooses not to believe. To many people, it sounds like some type of ancient fable. How is this all going to take place? It's going to take place because the true and living God said so. I'm amazed at how many people rail against God because they believe they have to follow someone. Why do I have to listen to this? However, they listen to everything else. Some of the most ridiculous rules they'll follow. Why are you following that? Oh, because the magistrate said so. Oh, to butt your head against the wall 15 times a day? Okay. Does that seem reasonable to you? No, but he said do it. I'm figuring it, it'll work out soon. Really? But the Lord says, follow me. I'm not doing that. That's just crazy. Eternal life, why would I want that? But you follow the most ridiculous things and won't even check yourself on it. And then want to call Christians crazy. I'm not saying they're not some that are. But the point is, is the word of God is not crazy. And that's the issue. False converts are created because their heart never intended on serving the true and living God at all. And that's where they come from. And I want to show you why I believe what I believe based on the scriptures dealing with the ABCs of salvation and expound on them. Because even though the gospel message and the ability to obtain salvation is indeed simple, the meaning behind these verses are very deep. 
and it should not be overlooked. So when it comes to the A of the ABCs of salvation, which is the acknowledging of sin, that's a huge step within itself. The Word of God reads, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. That is everyone. In verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All of humanity is under sin and no one could ever be righteous within their own strength. It doesn't happen. And when people challenge or ask the question, yo, so tell me what sin is. You know what it is. You live it every day, just like I do. You know exactly what it is. You have a toddler, maybe one and a half, just learned how to walk some six months ago and holding on to the edge of the table and you have his bottle up there and some earrings. And he'll reach for those earrings and then look at you. You ever seen that? They'll go reaching for the earrings and then look back at you at 18 months. We're born into this mess. It'd be different. Went straight forward, but you see this. We all do. That's what we're laughing about. All of nature is, in fact. Have you noticed that? Look at your animals. All of nature impacted by sin. Sin is a fact even if people grow numb to it. It does not remove the fact that sin is within all of us. Even after we are converted, we still have bouts of sin, some worse than others. Now remember, the spirit is made new, but the soul and the flesh are not. That happens later. So we have this simple message regarding salvation, but what takes place after salvation is not that simple. And again, I pray that we would get to this next week. Now, I want to continue with another verse associated with the A. This verse is also found in the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 23, as the word of God reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I do not know if I can highlight the implications of this verse properly. But I pray that the Lord will take hold of this passage for all of us. Think about this statement. For the wages of sin is death. Wages are earned. And absent Christ, we are all working towards our death. As soon as we come out the womb, we begin our lifelong struggle with wickedness. Our entire lives are recorded. All of those evil thoughts is captured on our souls. And the soul that does not have their sins covered and removed by the blood of Jesus Christ will unnecessarily suffer for rejecting this free gift of salvation. And this is not some New Testament twist regarding sin. Sin has always been the problem and has always been associated with death. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 4, the word of God reads, Behold, all souls or all lives are mine. It's the Lord. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Our sins need to be removed. And this passage has many implications. The most poignant is regarding sin. And everyone who chooses to keep that sin chooses to die. This is why salvation is needed. Since the beginning, salvation has always been the answer to redeem man. And only the true and living God offers this to all of man as a gift. Only the God of the Bible, no man-made religion, will ever be able to compete with God's word. There's only one truth, and that is the Bible. This is only found in the Christian faith. So when people say, well, they're all alike, they're not. Nothing is like the Christian faith. Nothing at all is like the Bible. But I have to go through these religions quickly. And I have to do so to show the uniqueness of those who follow Jesus Christ, the living word. Because salvation as a Jehovah's Witness is by being baptized as a Jehovah's Witness and earning everlasting life by door-to-door -door works. Salvation as a Mormon comes by works and there is no eternal life unless you become a member. According to the man-made religion of Christian science and the Unity School of Christianity, salvation is already here. And there is no sin, no evil, nor sickness, nor death. It's not real. Salvation by the New Age movement is achieved by self-awareness, Wiccans. Oh, they don't believe in sin, but their salvation lies in the preservation of the earth. In Scientology, salvation is freedom from reincarnation and there is no sin. In Hinduism, salvation is achieved through the release of reincarnation through yoga and meditation. In Krishna, salvation is achieved through total devotion to Krishna, chanting his name and worshiping images and following aspects of their law. 
In transcendental meditation, salvation is achieved through self-awareness and enlightenment. According to Sikhism, salvation is achieved through personal works. Your good must outweigh your bad. Just like in Islam, your good deeds must outweigh your bad deeds for Allah to judge you. And in Buddhism, salvation is accomplished when one eliminates all personal desire until nothing is desired and a state of non-existence is achieved. You can go through all of them. No one offers a gift of salvation but the God of the Bible. He is the only true God. Nothing or no one else even comes close. And this is why the B, being the believe in the ABCs of salvation, is easy to accept. You know why? Because God in his wisdom has separated himself from every other fable. So what you do is choose to believe a lie. And there's only one truth. That's why the gate is narrow. It's not because it's strict or hard or impossible. It's only one. That's one. And even all the cults that attempt to use the name Christian or the name of Jesus, they fail in presenting the gospel message. They end up robbing God of his glory and his goodness, and they put redemption back on man. You must do something. And that's one of the major ways to tell that it's false. But because God has made his gift so distinctive in the events of his resurrection, you know it happened. Just read the account. It's there for us. The evidence is all there. How much do you need? Those who have open hearts, when they hear it, they are drawn to it and they receive it. The word is heard and their hearts believe. And this is what Romans chapter 10, the second part of verse 9 speaks about as the word of God reads. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. I know that God has raised Jesus from the dead, even though I did not see it. I have complete faith in it. It happened. And this is not some blind faith. Because again, I know something is wrong with us. And we indeed need a savior. And when I see and read God's word and hear it, I know it's true. It's loving. It's prophetic. It's convicting. No man can do this. Man wouldn't even try because man is that jacked up. It's not my job to convince people either to believe, believe, believe. No, but it is my duty to tell you the truth. My duty to tell you that he did die and was raised from the dead by God himself and continues to live right now and it is the Savior. For those of you who do not believe, my question is, have you ever even looked it up for yourself? Or is it just what you heard somebody say? Laughing in the crowd with the others, going the same way as all the other fish. I want to ensure we get to the confessing part, which is to see that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, the, the question I have quickly is, why do we have to confess with our mouths? If I believe in my heart, why am I saying anything about it? Well, I believe the scriptures gives us that answer because they connect the heart and mouth on many occasions throughout the scripture. And we can see that here in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 3. The word of God reads, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So we have this one verse that has many implications to it in the context that the Apostle Paul is speaking about. But it does apply as well that the Holy Spirit leads you to speak the Lord is the true and living God. Jesus is Lord. And then captured in Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, the word of God reads, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. In the very end, what comes out of the mouth will reveal what your heart believes. And confessing Jesus is a part of that heartfelt conversion that seals our commitment and also our salvation with the Lord forever. Father in heaven, once again, Lord, thank you so much. And I pray you would take your message to your people, press it upon each of us, Lord, so that we can just study on it, meditate on it, go to the scriptures and search these things out and be better stewards of our time and better servants to you. We look forward to your return, but in the meantime, Lord, give us the strength and courage to do those good works that can only come via the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask for that anointing. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Christ, we pray.